Good evening, everyone, and happy Sunday night, and welcome to our latest Emerging Revolutionary War Revelry. I am Kevin Pollock. I'm going to be the host for tonight's Revelry, joined by two great ERW historians uh, here to talk about Maryland in the American Revolution. As you can uh, see by Phil's outfit there, Phil Greenwaltz, uh, to my left on the screen, as you can see by Phil's outfit with the uh, Baltimore Orioles uniform, Maryland has been in the news recently, haven't they, Phil? Yeah, for good, uh, for better and worse. Uh, the Orioles being sold, and then uh, the Ravens, um, you know, trying to keep it PG, not playing well last yeah, you, Sunday. You, so. you brought that up. Mark and I decided we weren't going to, but that's all on you. So that's what we're going to talk for the next hour now. No, just kidding. Uh, and uh, now that we've got Phil introduced, I want to go ahead and introduce Mark Wilcox as well, who, of course, just came out uh, recently with one of ERW's newest books alongside Rob Orison uh, about the Battle of Camden. So, Mark, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. I'm kind of like Phil because I'm I'm wearing my own colors, my own Camden shirt here. So I'm trying to represent as best I can. You know, you guys just left me out of this Maryland clothing that <laughs> I, I was supposed to wear. I don't think I have any Maryland clothes, Phil. I know Maryland likes to put their flag on everything, but uh, I don't have any of that apparel. So let's go ahead and we're going to get right into talking about Maryland, uh, specifically the Maryland line in the American Revolution. But before we uh, get to the war itself and the role that the Maryland line played, was going to see if one of you can kind of set the stage for us. What was Maryland like as a colony prior to the Revolutionary War and why did these Marylanders support the Patriot cause as compared to the Loyalist cause? I know it's never one way or the other, but when talking about the Maryland line, why were they Patriots? I'll take the first stab at it. I mean, if anyone knows Baltimore, we just like the riot. So um, give us a call, we'll do it. Uh, no, uh, I mean, Maryland, depending on how far back you want to go, is, the um, is a, of course, a Catholic colony. Um, there also, too, um, there is a, actually a high degree, um, which in the central and western part of the state, of a high German uh, population. A lot of them had uh, been brought in as indentured servants because of um, – the iron mills, the furnaces, um, some of the, the famous ones, of course, stretching as far south as west of Fredericksburg, Catherine's Furnace, uh, Catoctin Furnace, actually owned by the Johnson family, one of the uh, first governors, and later on, one of their family members was Bradley Johnson, who uh, was played a prominent role uh, in the, the American Civil War, only up the central Pennsylvania. And so you had their population uh, of um, Pennsylvania Dutch, Maryland Germans, and so forth, Um but you also had a uh, spring, uh, of course, in the southern Maryland, more uh, Anglican or Episcopalian later. Um, so you had a, a sprinkling of different uh, religions. But um, the state primarily, uh, it's one person once described Baltimore, it's the most northern southern town and the most southern northern town you'd ever visit. And so you had that kind of commerce. So you have a little bit of like that um, the embargo, the um um, the experiences like Boston will have on a limited thing, okay, like that uh, colonial connection. Um, and you have a deep-rooted um, sentiment in people like Charles Carroll, Samuel Johnson, William Paca, and other ones that um, are great legal minds. Um, and later after actually the revolution, you have the first president of what will become the United States, uh, Hanson, um, under the Article of Confederation, is actually from Southern Maryland. So wide disparate type of population um, started, I guess, as a, a refuge for Catholics then Germans. Um, and then of course, um, other ones of um, more industrial um, as they move toward Western Maryland. Mark, I want to give Phil, Phil was going to give me a great segue there, but I don't want to cut you off at all. If there's anything you wanted to add about Maryland prior to the American revolution. Uh, no, I agree with everything Phil says. You know, it's a refuge. Yeah, that's for, rare. Nobody agrees with Phil. For for you know Catholics, and you think about what the what the relationship was between the British monarchy in the in the uh, 16th century and earlier, and uh, and the Catholic Church. So, um, I can understand why there would be some animosity by the 17th by the 1700s. That that about sums it up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, Phil, I want to dive a little bit more into the Marylanders that will eventually join Washington's Continental Army and, and compose the Maryland line itself. You did some work in uh, grad school, I believe it was, diving into really who were these men and the demographics of the soldiers that made up the Maryland line. So share with us a little bit about what you found. Sure. Um, so 1775, uh, even prior to the, the Declaration of Independence and moving north, um, m most of it's well known that one company of riflemen, of course, under Daniel Morgan, marched north. But with them came two companies of actually uh, Maryland riflemen. Um, 
Thomas Price, um, commanded one of the uh, companies, um, and under him was a guy named Otho Williams, who actually would play prominent later on in the war in the Southern Theater. So the first kind of non-New England troops actually in the uh, uh, what would become the kind of the Army war would, would be these uh, riflemen from Virginia and Maryland. Uh, they mustered in at Frederick, Maryland, uh, one of the major t- Western towns, uh, population a few thousand at that time, I think by the mid-1800s uh, at it reached about 8,000, so I'll give you an idea of the population there. Um, and so they do march north. They arrive at Boston. Um, but Maryland um, is unique. Um, the first Maryland, um, a lot has been written, of course, later on. If you Google uh, or Wikipedia, the, the Marylanders um, for Guilford Courthouse, they're the ones that are depicted in that painting. Of course, the Maryland 400. Um, but what made them unique is that there was actually some of military or, or, or families that played a prominent role. Uh, Mordecai Gist uh, would later on uh, rise up to the ranks. Um, he actually is a uh, uh, unique connection. He is related to Christopher Gist, who uh, played as a prominent role with uh, George Washington in his early Western um, um, adventures, I guess you can say, uh, the famous Westerner and so forth, probably the Daniel Boone before the Daniel Boone, if you want to say so. Pretty much. Um, what, found, what I found out through the research, I wanted to f- uh, figure out who the first Marylanders were, um, and I ended up finding out that there were multiple men that would serve throughout the war. Um, and that if, what records that were found, some of these men, uh, including Williams, who would serve all the way until 1780, go home early in 1783. Um, if they were born in the colony of Maryland, what records we did have, they actually were about 20 years old was the aggregate age. Uh, if they were born or uh, from a farther, say, European or what we considered non-native colonial born they were actually in the mid-20s and so just gives you an idea of the the, the age range um, later on leading up to guilford the 1781 campaign there's actually a um a roster left of uh what supplies they had they were not paid in 1781 the first maryland and out of the 200 i think 80 men that were listed on the rolls at one time there were less than 80 full sets of uniform clothes stockings etc so um these men are it's literally starving, half naked, fighting the British army. Um, and they, but they have bayonets uh, on their rifles. They're one or their muskets. They're one of the only units in the Southern Army that will have it. They're one of the only units in the Northern Army at the time that would actually be trained with it. Um, and along with them is that you actually have this military order out of Baltimore, um, um, and the um, a high, the high population of Germans that actually went as well. Um, Otho Williams later on um, would help found the town of Williamsport, Maryland, uh, which plays a prominent role um, and actually rise to become offered the second highest command in the U.S. Army after. So long distinguished. A lot of these officers served long duration. And so that wasn't something else that made it remarkable. But uh, the first Maryland intrigued me because there are, I think, 22 men, if my memory serves me correct, that was in grad school about 10 years ago. So. Uh, numbers kind of start to get jumbled, but there, I think there was about 20 some men, 22 or so, to, that both survived what happened on Long Island and what happened down at Camden um, and Guilford. Um, and so it's an amazing story. Trying to recorrect what these guys fought for, why they fought, and what what experience they would have had. Unfortunately, none of those 22 that I could found were literate enough to leave a big record of that service. But man, if they could have wrote some type of memoir, it would have been amazing to see uh, and hear. So. Just kind of an idea of the general age, makeup, um, and that they were one of the only units that um, um, were trained with the bayonet, um, which also we have a compatriot, Mark Malloy, who is very fond of the movie The Patriot. And so any unit that pull, or depicted in that movie that had bayonets, I know he hates it as a Virginian. They would have been Marylanders there uh, on The Patriot. So, you know, Phil, that's always intrigued me. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Kevin. That's always intrigued me about the first Maryland because <clears throat> when the war starts, I mean, these are these are some of the most uh, well-equipped soldiers here that's going to be fighting on the Patriot side, uniformed and and drilled and disciplined. And um, uh, it, it's just extremely interesting. And they really, they, they, in my opinion, they form a reputation there with that. And again, to be able to use those bayonets, know how to use that equipment and to, to march with pride. You, you know, you talked about the the riflemen that actually marched with Morgan. This is this is Western Maryland, just like Western Pennsylvania, Southwestern Virginia. These were hunters. These were people who, some of them professional hunters, 
uh, where they would certainly use the American long rifle because their livelihoods depended upon their marksmanship. And uh, and then when you mentioned Christopher Gist, I've always been intrigued with Christopher Gist. You know, this was a pro this from a prominent family in eastern part of Maryland, and yet he chooses to go west, become an Indian trader, and really was very much an early frontiersman and was invaluable to George Washington's trip uh, to to negotiate with the French commander to to leave the Ohio Valley. And uh, I think Washington probably owed his life to getting to, to get, getting him back to civilization after that. I mean, he did. I think they all capsized in the, what is it? The, the Allegheny. The river they capsized, the Allegheny. Allegheny. And he pulls yeah. them out and helps start the fire. So, I mean, yeah, he is uh, saved Washington before Washington saved the United States. So, um, there it is. A Marylander saved a Virginia. We'll just. <laughs> Sounds like a great name for a biography. The man who saved Washington before Washington saved the country. I like that. Phil, get on it. <laughs> they also, one other thing I think that helped the Marylanders, um, and I, I had to pull up this quote. It's a great article from uh, the Journal of the American Revolution. Um, and it says that the longevity, there was like of the known men that they could trace, almost 90% of the men served for three years or more um, in some of the Maryland units. And then so, same with some of the officers. Six up on the Maryland line, because there's more than just the first Maryland. I think they go up to the six or so Maryland um regiments um and so a lot of them were colonels generals that served also on average of two to three years uh through it so that's something else and we make known about that uh, with the militia company of uh, john hancock um that uh, ran in in boston that was more ceremonial there was a similar one called the baltimore cadets in uh the city of baltimore raised up they had uniforms military prowess but apparently mordecai guest actually took it i don't want to offend our uh, friends from the great state of massachusetts but took the military training maybe a little more serious prior to the war than John Hancock did with uh, that artillery unit. And so some of that, that prowess, but also uh, during the French and Indian War, I think played a major part is that Maryland's border will be shrunk uh, by Native American raids. And so these men, especially in the Frederick area, like uh, Mark was alluding to, the rifle meant food and survival uh, because the border came almost all the way to what is Fort Frederick and so forth, especially after Braddock's defeat and so forth. So uh, men born on the uh, outskirts of civilization um, tend to know how to survive. Um, and unfortunately, um, for the Maryland riflemen, a lot of them will be captured and imprisoned after the fall of Fort Washington there at the end of the New York campaign um, and find their way onto the, the what is the HMS Jersey. So both of you guys have talked about, and Phil, we're going to segue to the New York campaign in just a moment, but you, you've both talked about the prowess and the prestige of the Marylanders. And, you know, it's, sometimes you wonder with certain military units that find themselves always in the toughest of spots, is that by by chance or by choice of a uh, commander above them? And certainly the Marylanders find themselves in a couple of very tight spots, including a spot that lends their their nickname of the, the Maryland 400. Uh, at the Battle of Brooklyn in 1776. So go ahead and fill us in on on uh, just exactly what the Maryland 400 is and what it does specifically to help save the American army uh, in Long Island. Sure, they are. Um, uh, so the uh, Maryland 400 as well, um, I'll give a shout out to that uh, the Delawares as well. Um, you have the Delaware and the Maryland line there, and there's Lord Sterling at the battle. Um, the, um, the American line... Uh, um, I mean, it's turning into to a route, and I'll um, uh, Mark, feel free to jump in at any time. Um, but um, the Marylanders know what's going to um, happen, and they are actually ordered by Lord Lord Sterling. Uh, once again, I love Lord Sterling. Like, hey, I think I'm related to this what peerage or baronage back yeah. in Scotland. Tenuous claim. I'm going to call myself a lord. This is America. We can do it. So, um, and it is a uh, frontal assault. Um, and uh, out of the 400, the, um, it's usually mythologized that there's 400 casualties. Um, no, that's how many men made made the charge. Out of that, 250 are um, killed, wounded, or missing. So, I mean, the numbers are drastic. Um, it prompts George Washington to say, by God, what good men uh, this day I must lose by looking across the river. Um, some of them, like Gist and other ones, will kind of find their way back through this swampy morass of Long Island. Um, I'm actually talking about Swampy Morris. I'm not talking about rush hour down on, on Long Island. It actually is, at that time, um, fields and swamps. And so they make it back, and some of them do reconstitute uh, part of that, um, uh, the Maryland line uh, that continues on. But uh, other ones, yeah, 
um, killed, wounded, laid there. Unfortunately, because of the sprawl of New York today, um, I think they've located the general spot. I think it's above a auto mechanic. Uh, there's a plaque on the wall that says where they charged. And there's a little, little small park there in New York. Um, but uh, before I hand it over to Mark, I do want to say that besides uh, the Marylanders and the Delaware's uh, soldiers, continental line, the Delaware Blues that serve admirably there, um, one of the, the one of the units that also helps in that, um, it plays prominent role later on, is actually um, Massachusetts soldiers, the Marbleheaders under uh, Glover, who John Glover, who um, actually get the survivors of Washington's army back across. I think that's what the East River at the time um, and everything. Um, and so um, you have the cream of Washington's army in the right spot at the right time, staving off what could have been a severe disaster um, at Long Island. Absolutely. And, you know, let, let's just set the scene here. I mean, this was really the, the first major battle and and where Washington's forces are pitted on Long Island against really the cream of the British Army. They get flanked and units all over the field are either surrendering up, getting shot down or running. I mean, they're running for their lives because these are these are greenhorns. These are mainly untested um, even Continentals, these are untested, the militiamen and so forth. And I, I, the Battle of Long Island in New York, I mean, this is where the Marylanders really established their reputation as men, as they used to say in the Western frontier, men with the bark on. I mean, men who knew what they were about. And these guys knew what the odds were when everybody else was running. These guys under Lord Sterling are standing fast and even charging, knowing most likely they'll be shot down. And you know, they, they, their reputation as some of the toughest combat troops that will ever come out of the Continental Army and the American Revolution established right here in New York. And, uh, and, and that reputation would continue to follow them because they would continue to uh, exemplify that, that type of courage under fire. As you guys are talking, a, a quote comes to mind that I just happen to have handy. It actually comes from uh, the book Band of Brothers and, and Major uh, Dick Winters, and he said, in combat, your reward for a good job done is that you get the next tough mission. Yeah. And uh, I think that pretty well sums up what these these Marylanders, the Maryland line uh, has to go through. And of course, they're going to be involved in many tough missions throughout the course uh, of their history. Um, we're we're going to kind of fast forward a little bit. Uh, I don't want to gloss over anything else, but, but talk about, um, you know, the Marylanders will eventually go south. Uh, rather than fighting in the Northern Theater in 1780, Washington is going to select the Maryland line and the Delaware line to go south and aid in the Southern Theater. So why did Washington choose them? Uh, just another tough mission? And they were the good troops that, that happened to get that tough mission or other reasons as well? No, I think absolutely. Um, and think about this, by, by the spring of 1780, the war in the North is at stalemate. I mean, there hadn't been any major combat really since uh, Monmouth Courthouse in June of 1778. And the British war effort has moved south. Sir Henry Clinton is uh, in command. He's going to try his luck at, at capturing Charleston again, having failed in 1776. And uh, he's doing it right this time. He's bringing about 15,000 uh, British soldiers and sailors, and he's going to land his infantry. And they were going to dig siege lines and really start pounding Charleston. And Washington is going to order that division of Maryland and Delaware troops, really the two brigades, the first and second brigade of the Maryland line, including Lieutenant Colonel uh, Joseph Vaughn's Del vaunted Delaware regiment. They're going to be heading south. Originally, they're heading down to the relief of Charleston. And uh, Charleston does fall on May the 12th before they can get there. And, you know, they're under the command of Major General Baron Johann de Cobb. And... <clears throat> De Cobb is German born. He is he is reared in the French military as part of a German uh, regiment there and uh, joins the officer corps and serves with distinction in uh, the War of Austrian Secession and the Seven Years War in the early 1760s. He is elevated to nobility. So his rank of baron is legit. I mean, this guy knows what he's about. He's an he's a, a veteran of countless European battlefields. He's, he can command combat and supply. He's expert at maneuver, maneuvering large bodies of men. In 1768, he comes to America on behalf of the of the uh, of the French crown to really poll American colonists, see where they stand. Uh, how are they feeling about 
what's happening with uh, George Thurow, what's happening with taxation, what's happening with uh, the idea that some men are starting to throw around about becoming independent. When he returns almost a decade later as a fighting man, 1777, he's coming with a much younger Marquis de Lafayette. And by 1780, um, Baron de Cobb is 59 years old, given command of that Maryland and Delaware division and ordered south uh, to try to relieve uh, Charleston. Um, how did he get along with these troops? Think about it. Baron de Cobb was a fighter. Baron de Cobb knew what he was about, and he's commanding, again, some of the best troops in the Continental Army, some of the toughest combat troops to come out of that army. And I think uh, I think they synced up pretty well. Would you would you uh, say that, Phil? No, exactly. I mean, he is a fighter. He is a, a strong world uh, gentleman that yeah knows the American kind of has his thumb on the American uh, psyche as well. Um, he, I mean, he hardships. He's on the same ship as Lafayette, I think, when they uh, crash into what the South Carolina coast. Um, one of the other reasons, I mean, the Marylanders and Delaware are picked because of that military prowess, but also. Um, if you look at Washington, there's not much else. Luckily, he's got the best still to send. The Virginia Continentals are pretty much wiped out with the surrender at Charleston, uh, South Carolina. There has been a mutinies and so forth in the Pennsylvania line and other ones. So he's got he, who are you going to send south? Well, let's send the Mel Maryland and Delaware. They're the most southern units still left with the main Continental Army. Um, and they have that command structure. I mean, they've, they're once again, they're organized, they're structured. They've been through the test, um, and as we said earlier, their officer corps and so forth, they're still pretty well um, um, intact from guys who have served, guys that we don't know today, like Dunby, or uh, besides the guests, you also have the Howards, but you have these guys, Eccleston, who all these um, officers that um, have been through the test of battle, and so that's something else. Washington, we know, harps a lot on not raising an army every year. And here's two units, um, and in the Delaware line, it's what Knowlton, I think, who will serve in more battles than any other American soldier until he's killed out west in, um, what is that, uh, declares, or tip, either tip a canoe or one of those ones out west, I forget which battle he uh, gets killed at, but, so these are the best of the best, and they're going to face the, the best under the British with Cornwallis, um, especially in the interior of South Carolina, uh, which, um, at the, the Battle of Camden, and uh, the, before I pass it over to the markets, some of these guys um, still laid there well into the 21st century. So it's uh, their, their commitment to staying on the field. Absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. So before we get to uh, the 21st century Marylanders or 21st century history, I guess we're talking about the Maryland line. I want to give Mark plenty of time. I know Mark's done some great research into the Battle of Camden. Mark, kind of set the stage for us there with Camden and, and the Maryland's, uh, Marylanders role at that battle as well in 1780. Absolutely. When Charleston falls in May of 1780, uh, Sir Henry Clinton, the idea is the British Army is going to move through South Carolina to the back country and then into North Carolina, Virginia as well, because the southern states have been supplying men and munitions. And so to knock those out of the war would be a really a, a coup for the, for the British arms. And so um, Clinton is going to establish some outposts really in the back country, down in Augusta, Georgia, also at the Western Post, Western South Carolina at 96, Stockade Town of 96, and then the town of Camden. Camden was about 20 years old. It was established by a man named Joseph Kershaw. And if that name sounds familiar, it should, because he's the grandfather of Major General Joseph Kershaw of the uh, Army of Northern Virginia. And actually, General Kershaw is buried there in Camden. And it becomes a very important British military depot, and but it's weakly held. Um, Lord Francis Rawdon is in command, and I mean, and this is a, an, an, an Irish soldier who is 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 um, quite adept in his field, but he's commanding early on mainly provincial troops and loyalist militia, that type of thing, and he's dealing with um, with illness, especially among the seventy first regiment of foot, the, the Fraser's Highlanders, and so he's expecting reinforcements from Charleston, and, and then he finds out that there is a an American force coming his way. And they're, they're going to be on now in the command of the new Southern Department commander, and that's Horatio Gates. That suits Baron de Cobb fine. First of all, he's in command of the, of, these, of the two Maryland brigades. It's only about 1,500 men. So it's kind of amusing when uh, Horatio Gates comes down and takes overall command. He refers to these guys as his grand army. And... Um, 
by this point, Gates uh, comes down, he takes command. Baron de Cobb is happy because he's not a politician. Uh, he's a soldier. He hates having to treat with colonial governments and governors and, and beg for supplies, that kind of thing. He didn't have a high opinion of Virginians after meeting with Thomas Jefferson in Richmond on his way down. And uh, But they're in camp on the Buffalo Fort of Deep River, uh, end of July, and Horatio Gates arrives and uh, begins to, you know, really take command. Um, they're trying to get North Carolina militiamen who were down on the Yatkin River, about 2,000 strong, to join them. And their commander, Richard Caswell, former governor of North Carolina, is not cooperative at all. He's he's foraging and he's picking the countryside clean. And so uh, the Maryland brigades are starving. These poor guys are just really lean, really hungry. If they're lucky, they can get some green corn out in somebody's field. Um, but, you know, this is a very difficult time. But the continuing to move south because the people of South Carolina are pleading for help to rid us of these, these infernal redcoats. And so even before Gates gets there, uh, DeKalb is, is still heading south and he's heading for the back country, you know, Scotch Irish. Um, it's a volatile area already because uh, people are fighting less about independence and more about vengeance and settling old scores and just old enemies trying to get at each other. So a violent area. But Baron DeKalb makes the decision that if he can, if he can capture Camden, then maybe he can isolate the British in the Western Post at 96, and maybe they can establish some kind of control. And indeed, by the time Horatio Gates arrives, he is under the same opinion. He gets word from the partisan commander, Thomas Sumter, that, uh, some, that Camden is weakly held, and if you move quickly enough, you can capture the whole shebang. And so Gates is going to, on July the 26th, order his weak and starving army to march, and he wants to go directly south so to the a direct uh, um, marching uh, order to Camden. His officers are appalled. Their army is not ready to, to march or to fight, and none more than Colonel Otho Holland Williams. And Phil, you've mentioned him a couple of times. He was commander of the 6th Maryland. They were part of the 2nd Brigade, but he was also acting deputy adjutant general here, and he leaves a very uh, detailed account of this campaign uh, after the war. Uh, they want to go on a more circuitous route through Salisbury and Charlotte, where the population is more pre or, or really pro, pro patriot kind of thing. And maybe foraging would have been a little bit better, but Gates is adamant. He wants to head straight south. So they're going to skirmish with Lord uh, uh, Rawdon's forces there at Little Lynch's Creek. But Gates' main uh, aim as at a commercial center that owned by a loyalist called Rugeley's Mills. And it sits right on the, the main artery, part of the Great Wagon Road, you know, that highway that runs all the way from Philadelphia through Pennsylvania, Maryland, through the Shenandoah Valley, all the way down into, into South Carolina. But it's a direct route 13 miles away to Camden. And so the stage is set. And um, Gates is going to send his... Uh, engineering officer, Lieutenant Colonel John Christian South, South to reconnoiter. And I think maybe he's starting to put together what his battle plan is going to be. And Semp comes back with a pretty favorable report. Seven miles north of Camden, he finds a, a, very, a very deep creek, Sanders Creek. Some people call it Saunders Creek back then. Deep Creek and the only fordable spot for miles around and out of the direction is right there on the Great Wagon Road. And I think right then, uh, Gates starts putting together a battle plan. You know, he had trumpeted himself as the victor at Saratoga. But indeed, the, the Continental Works, the tight Bemis Heights, blocked the river road along the Hudson. It did force General uh, John Burgoyne's forces up uh, into the high ground to do battle there at Saratoga. And of course, that's an American victory. And I think maybe that is what um, Gates is thinking about. If he can entice Lord Rodden to come and attack him across this deep creek, this body of water. Uh, and he's on ground of his own choosing. What he doesn't know is that reinforcements have now reached Camden, and uh, they are under the command of Lord uh, Charles Cornwallis himself, who has left uh, Charleston. He's now in command of all Southern forces. Lieutenant Colonel uh, Sir Henry Clinton has returned to New York, and it's Cornwallis, in my opinion, probably the best combat general that the British had throughout the war. And uh, he is commanding in person. He writes a letter to uh, Lord George Germain, the uh, Secretary of State for the Colonies, and saying that he's left Charleston in really great shape. 
And he has nothing to lose by attacking Gates and absolutely everything to gain. What has intrigued me about the Battle of Camden comes down to this one fact. Both generals on, on August the 15th, 10 o'clock at night, they both put their armies on the road, the same road, the Great Wagon Road. One army's heading north, one army's heading south. And at 2.30 in the morning, these two armies are going to blunder into each other. And uh, to me, I write in the book that it's uh, probably the most, uh, the biggest coincidence of the war. But the Americans, or I should say the Patriots, because there were plenty of Americans fighting on both sides, a lot of loyalist forces. And the, uh, the Gates' army is... Not only weak and starving, but he makes some pretty, pretty terrible decisions. Before they march at 10 p.m. on August the 15th, he is he makes a decision to feed this army. Now it's not just the 1,500 um, Maryland and Delaware uh, soldiers here. Richard Caswell's 2,000 North Carolina North Carolina militia have joined him, and about 700 Virginia militia under Brigadier General Edward Stevens have marched down. So uh, he thinks he's got about 7,000 troops. Arthur Williams actually comes up with a more reliable figure, roughly about 3,300 or so. So about half of what Gates thought he had, but he thought they would, they're enough for his purposes, is what he says. And, but he decides to, he's, these men are starving. He decides to feed them a full meal out of the hospital stores, a, a full meal of fresh beef and bread on these very empty stomachs, but it gets worse. You know, most armies, when you're going to march to the attack, you're given a ration of some form of ardent spirit, right? Well, the plan, the buttermilk was Gates had no ardent spirits. He didn't have any whiskey. He didn't have any rum. What he did have was a supply of molasses from which you could make rum, right? He rations out about a gill, four ounces of molasses to each of his soldiers, along with that big, heavy meal on these very empty stomachs. And Arthur Williams and other authors, officers will write about all night long how so many of these soldiers are leaving the ranks and going to relieve themselves. These guys were sick with diarrhea and dysentery, sick, I mean, just, just god-awful sick. And now they've got to march 13 miles and probably fight a battle. So things are not going well. By 2.30 in the morning, cavalry forces that Gates has in his vanguard run smack dab into the British Legion Dagoons. Of course, they're under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton, who is establishing for himself in the South just this, this horrible reputation for cruelty. Some of it's justified, some of it's not. Um, and so for about 15 minutes, there is a big firefight here between these two units. Light infantry, uh, Virginia light infantry, under the command of Charles Cor uh, Porterfield, are going to stream in, lay down a base of fire, and really just stop the Dragoons in their tracks. The two sides will pull apart. It's a, it's a fierce fight, only lasts about 15 minutes, and now both sides are going to um, kind, of, kind of await daylight, right? But cavalry on both sides are still active, and so prisoners are taken, and now both commanders are going to find out just who it is in front of them. Arthur Williams says that when he informs Horatio Gates that it's none other than Lord Cornwallis out there, that Gates kind of turned white and kind of blinked and immediately sent for another officer's call. And um, he says that he meets with his officers, asks them what they think we should do. And after a pause, General Stevens of Virginia spoke up and said, gentlemen, what else can we do now but fight? And no one was in disagreement. However, uh, Alto Holland Williams wrote that when he went to summon Baron de Cobb for that officer's call, the first thing out of de Cobb's mouth was, and has the general um, ordered a retreat. I mean, think about this. I mean, you've got Baron de Cobb, who is a master at maneuver and maneuvering much larger bodies of troops than what we have here. And maybe the idea was to fall back to 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 land of your own choosing. Right. Uh, maybe a more advantageous situation. If he did have some uh, uh, some ill feelings about standing where they were and fighting, according to Horatio Gates, he didn't speak up in the officer's call. Now. Horatio Gates has been criticized quite a bit for this battle, but and none more than for how he establishes his battle line. And guys, help me out, because you may have a source on this. You know, you, when it comes to history, you sometimes, they're myths. Sometimes they're things that, uh, stories that get told from one generation of historians to another. You just kind of pass these things down. And there's one that I don't know is a myth or not, neither myself 
or my co-author Rob Orson were able to find an original source and Phil, you may have one. I'd love to hear it if you do. The idea of the the place of honor in the British battle line, right? That traditionally the British would place their most veteran regiments on the right side, the right of their battle line, and their less experience on the left. And so, if that I'll actually true, interject real quick here about yes, that, uh, because it actually um, uh, originates. It's a uh, because it goes back, they believe, all the way to ancient Greece um, and even back to Sparta or the, the Roman legions, because your strongest, going back when you had short swords or sea axes, you would hold your shield on the left and your strong, your strong hand, most people were right-handed. And so the stronger men you always put on, on and your strongest right-handed men you always put on, on the right side of your line. So you would try to crash in and then crush down to get behind kind of, um, the, I guess, what the shield walls and so forth. And so then it continued up that um, with, with the rifles and so forth. So it became that spot of honor. You were the, the biggest, the strongest, and so forth. And so by the time of the revolution, it was more just a symbolic thing of like, this is the place of honor because of that great military tradition. So that's the only source or linkage tracing it all the way back um, because it was just a lot of these soldiers or junior officers say that's how we were trained. That's how we were trained. And then you follow that thought back. And they believe it did uh, back with the ancient uh, Greeks and Spartans um, that because of what uh, predominant hand. So that's the best uh, that historians, military historians, um, and I spent way too long in a rabbit hole trying to figure this out uh, one time. And so that's as far back. Um, um, and so, yeah, that's where it came from. So, Well, that's that's awesome to hear. And so think about now Horatio Gates, as a, you know, he's a retired British officer. And in this case, maybe he's got about 25 years experience in the British Army working against him here in Camden because um, the two armies are actually going to straddle the Great Wagon Road. And so on Gates' right, his far right, he is going to place Brigadier General Mordecai Guest's uh, 2nd Maryland Brigade. Now, these are three regiments, first of all, from Maryland troops, the 2nd, the 4th, and the, and William's own 6th Maryland, and then Joseph Vaughn's Delaware Regiment. There's a, a swampy area, McDonald's branch here on the right flank, and so that's believed there's going to be a, a modicum of protection against any type of British flanking maneuver. And uh, they, uh, this is this is Gist command, but the American right flank is going to be over the over under the overall command of Baron de Kalb. There is a battery of two six pounders under a Captain Anthony Singleton in the middle of the road, and now on the left side is where Gates is going to place is militia, these greenhorns, these untried militiamen. Now we're down to about 1,200 or so North Carolina militiamen right there close to the road. To their left, on slightly higher ground, is Edward Stevens' 700 militiamen, who have bayonets themselves, by the way. They had just been issued those bayonets the day before. There's uh, some light infantry on the left flank, also some swampy area there as well. Uh, about 60 dragoons uh, in support. But this is what Gates does. What about the 1st Maryland Brigade? This is the, the 1st, the 3rd, the 5th, and the 7th Maryland Regiments. Where are they? They're not in the main battle line. They're in support. They were basically straddling the Great Wagon Road behind the battle line. Why is that? Why did he have his veteran regiments towing the line? Because on the other side, Cornwallis is going to do the exact same thing. On his right, he is going to post nearest the road his own 33rd Regiment of Foot, and to their right, the 23rd Regiment of Foot, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, four companies of light infantry uh, on the, the extreme right flank. Left of the road, Lord Rotten is in command of provincial troops, the uh, Volunteers of Ireland, the uh, Royalist North Carolina militia. There's going to be the militia from Banneter Tarleton's uh, British Legion, and behind them at support. Uh, North Carolina Loyalist Militia under uh, Colonel Samuel Bryant and talk about what a civil war this was. Bryant was actually an uncle by marriage to Frontiersman Daniel Boone. And so in support on both sides of the road are two battalions of the 71st Highlanders uh, and Tarleton's British Legion Dragoons. And so we're all set. Stage is set. Um, the British start falling into line 
and the artillerist in the middle of the road, uh, Anthony Singleton, sees that movement. He he um, lets off the Williams know what's going on, and Williams just tells him right off, fire, open fire. This is a grape shot. This is canister, exploding rounds. They're going to do a lot of damage to the 33rd Regiment of Foot. And then Williams is going to ride off to find Gates and let him know what this firing is about. And he says Gates just kind of looked at him almost like he was in a stupor. They're noticing now on the British far right, the 23rd Regiment of Foot, coming online. Of course, that meant something different back then, getting online. And so Williams comes up with a great idea. The Virginians are already in line of battle. They're ready to go. Why not advance them? Why not start the attack right there? Maybe that can throw the 23rd Regiment of Foot into some type of confusion, keep them from establishing their formations as they normally do. Um, Gates just kind of looks at Williams and just doesn't say anything. Finally, he comes out of it, yes, 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 let's, let's go ahead and do that. And Gates says, uh, or, or Williams says, that's the last conversation he has with Horatio Gates. Uh, Williams is going to ride off to find uh, the Virginian uh, General Stevens to give him that order. Now, Gates is is going to send his own A, a Thomas Pickney, to his right to give that same order to advance to Baron de Cobb. And then he's going to send orders back to William Smallwood, commanding the 1st Maryland uh, Brigade, to move up. As Virginians move forward on the attack, the 1st Maryland is ordered to move in and occupy that land now being vacated by the Virginians. And the problem is these Virginians are greenhorns. And their fire is of little effect to the British. The British continue to form, and then they deliver their own uh, well-aimed, believe it or not, well-aimed volley. And then they are on the attack with, with muskets aslant and bayonets gleaming in the early morning sun, and it is just too much for the Virginians. They actually become first in flight. These guys throw away their muskets, and a lot of them are loaded muskets, and they're running, and Edward Stevens is riding in among them, saying, fellas, we've got bayonets. We just got them the day before. But that's too late. Panic has set in. Virginians are on the run, and that is going to spread over to the North Carolina militia. And the majority of them, there was one regiment, the second North Carolina under Lieutenant Colonel uh, Hal Dixon will stand fast and fight with the Continentals. The rest of the North Carolina militia throwing down their muskets, and they are hoofing it. They're running. Horatio Gates and Richard Caswell, they're going to get swept up in this uh, retreat of the militia. And after the battle, Gates is going to write to Congress saying that he tried several times to rally the militia to no avail. He's finally swept away from the battlefield. And at some point, I guess he makes the decision that his survival was more important than the survival of the Maryland line. So he winds up riding about 180 miles in the next three days. and He'll show up in Hillsboro in the, at the rendezvous point. And his reputation as a combat commander is ruined and is never going to recover. Now, on the other side of the road, you know, think about it. It's the opening minutes of the battle here, early morning of August 16, 1780, and the American left flank has dissolved. There is no there is no left flank. The 1st Maryland, now those regiments are going to move up. They're going to let the Virginians through because these are professional soldiers, in my opinion. And then they're going to start slugging it out with the 23rd Regiment foot. And then, of course, the 33rd is going to join in. And so um, it, it's hot fighting there for the 1st Maryland. On the right side of the road, Baron de Cobb is going to give the order to attack. And he, he himself is going to lead three bayonet assaults. They're going to really chew up the volunteers of Ireland. They'll, they'll capture some artillery. There was rumors that uh, even Lord Rodden himself was captured at this point. Um, but it's a different story when it comes to the British provincials and the Loyalist militia. These guys are well equipped. They are well trained and they are battle veterans themselves. They get pushed by the Marylanders. They'll get pushed way back. Even though they bend, they never quite break and they'll push back to themselves. So you've got a um, just something going on where the Continentals are going to push them, fall back, push again, fall back. Baron de Cobb has his horse shot out from under him. He still continued to attack. He gets slashed in the forehead with a, with a saber. Uh, someone from the Delaware line actually puts a bandage on it. He's still going. This guy is going to continue to fight until he goes down from 11 wounds. He's wounded 11 times in this engagement. He receives three musket balls and eight piercings of the bayonet. He finally goes down. British troops will find him after the battle. Lord Cornwallis himself is going to come along and find him and and lament that he's finding him in this condition. And they treat Baron de Cobb 
with the utmost military courtesy. And Dukov was actually transferred back to Camden, and he's being looked at now by Cornwallis' own surgeon. He doesn't um, survive, unfortunately. And he, legend has it that he's buried between two, two British officers who have fallen in the battle. And uh, later on, um, Washington will come in the 1790s when he's visiting the various states and pays homage uh, the grave of Dukov. But over the years, people in Camden sort of forgot about where he was. No one knew where he was. He was a Mason. So the South Carolina Masons in 1824-25 wanted to honor him. And an all-out search was made for that original uh, gravesite. They do finally find him. His remains now rest in the churchyard of Bethesda Presbyterian Church. Bill, you've been there. I've been there. And the cornerstone of that memorial was laid in 1825, and it was laid by none other than the now aged Marquis de Lafayette, who has come back to the United States on his triumphant tour. The right side of the Continental Line here back in August of 1780, these guys are now just about surrounded. The uh, Smallwood's 1st Brigade gets pushed back. There's a gap between the uh, the 1st Maryland Brigade and the 2nd Maryland Brigade. Arthur Williams is with the 1st Brigade. He's fighting. He looks over. He sees the 2nd Brigade regiments starting to fall apart. And he rides over and he finds his own regiment, the 6th Maryland. In command is Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin Ford. And Williams comes up and asks him, can we not stand here? And Ford just tells him flatly that, uh, you know, basically it's impossible. Um, they've done all that could be expected of them. We are surrounded. And uh, the enemy attacks with bayonet. And uh, at that point, it's every man for himself. So the Continentals are either going to continue to fight, get shot down, or else captured. Mordecai Gist is going to lead at least 100 men, maybe more, through that swamp on the right flank, and they'll actually survive. They show up a couple of weeks later in Charlotte, and to the astonishment of most people, most people thought all of the Continentals were either captured or shot. And these Maryland troops are going to form the nucleus of the now rebuilt Southern Army, and uh, who are now, by December of 1780, going to be under the command of Major General uh, Nathaniel Green of Rhode Island. Mark, you did a, an awesome job painting the uh, the picture there. So I just want to remind everybody, uh, if you're interested in the book that uh, that Mark just recently authored with the ERW series, it's All That Can Be Expected, uh, The Battle of Camden and the British High Tide in the South, August 16th, 1780, alongside Rob Orison. And uh, Mark, you, Kevin, you what, what a coincidence. About... I just happened to have a copy of the book right here. Gee whiz. What a happy yeah. accident that is. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. It, it was great you telling the story of DeKalb's remains, too, because the story of Camden today, there's recent discovery of remains on the battlefield, and some of those may very well be the Marylanders themselves. How do we how do we know that? How were they found? Well, you know what? I've become pretty good friends with the two uh, leading archaeologists, Dr. Stephen Smith and Jim, or Jim Legg, and um, was down there in Camden. When you're writing a book, we make, Rob and I made several trips and made the acquaintance and friendships of a lot of local historians down there who were just awesome to us. And uh, we were down there, you know, it's been known since around 1980 or so that some remains uh, of, of soldiers were on the field. Of course, the British win the battle. They're going to dig just, just shallow graves and just, you know, dump the Americans in, and even some of their own people. And it started off in, in the late summer of 2022. Um, I think Jim Lake told me that they were really going to be looking for at seven different grave sites, they thought, where remains have been found by relic hunters over the years. About 800 acres of the uh, of the battlefield is has been preserved, owned by historic Camden Foundation. And um, this thing, more people joined them, more archaeologists joined them. Turns out they wound up finding remains of 14 veterans. 14 veterans, in some cases, just only about six inches of soil you know these are these are men who've been lying in those unmarked graves for over 240 years and now they've been found so how do we know who they are well first of all one of them turned out based on you know really dna and and dental research to be uh native american and then when you determine that this is a native american person it's a whole new protocol right and then another one was actually a brit it was uh, we know that at least 10 men of the 71st uh, Regiment of Foot, Frazier's Highlanders, were killed. So there's probably more remains out there. But this one that was found 
was a member of the 71st. And it's the pewter buttons that are still there. And, and you know, he's buried with full honors. He's basically laid out. He's got his weapons with him. Most of that is deteriorated. Um, uh, and so certain there's certain artifacts that are st were still in that grave. Um, the others, it's where they were found. And it's really on the right side uh, of the road. And then maybe just a, a just a, just barely across the road, as a matter of fact. What are they finding? They're finding in these shallow graves, those pewter buttons. A lot of them were not in great shape. Some of them uh, were fairly decent. But those USA buttons that uh, really are distinctive on the continental coats. And uh, that's who was fighting over there. It was Jacob leading those, the, you know, the, the men of the 2nd Maryland Brigade. And there's a couple of uh, men in their 30s that were found. Maybe they were sergeants. But a lot of these men, and some of them were mass graves. Um, I say men, they were boys. Some of them were 15, 16 years old. And, um, uh, but they're still, they were still carrying that that reputation as just being this, this tough combat unit. And it's just young men who never really got a chance to, to live their lives. And I love the fact that after all these years, they're now in marked graves. So they were placed in, in handmade wooden coffins, they were beautiful. They were, the wood came from historic Camden. And um, the idea, they were, it was this past April, 2023. It's a huge ceremony, statewide ceremony. The, the governor of South Carolina and various other dignitaries spoke. The town of Camden, these folks came out as volunteers and it was awe inspiring. There was a beautiful funeral service at Bethesda Presbyterian Church. For these remains, they had they were lying in state in the rebuilt Kershaw House the night before. Uh, a huge United States military presence because of the gentleman from the 71st Highlanders. Uh, there was a United Kingdom honor guard there as well. And um, German military were there because of Baron de Cobb. Um, it was awesome. But the military swept in. The idea was that these men were supposed to go back into their original grave sites. It's only now they're going to be in marked graves, right? And the military swept in and said, no, no, can't do that. They just wouldn't allow it to happen. And so these men who were supposed to be, re be reburied in the latter part of April continued to lie in the coroner's office. You know, they still had the remains. They were in those brand new coffins. But it wasn't until, I think, some, by the mid to late summer, uh, they were finally laid to rest in the um, the Quaker burying ground where Joseph Pershaw is buried as well. But at least they are. They are at peace there, but it's not exactly and what like said in marked graves, finally. Finally in marked graves. And there's even some more DNA testing done. So who knows? Wouldn't it be awesome if somehow, some way, some of their identities could be found? Never put it beyond technology today. It really is, yeah. is pretty amazing. Um, so in the last few minutes that we've got, um, just want to wrap up the story of the Maryland line. They're not done after Camden. As you mentioned, Mark, they're going to form the nucleus of the new Southern Army, and they're going to play a prominent role at Guilford Courthouse as well in March of 1781. Uh, go ahead and fill in their story um, real quick as, as we uh, end this, because I, I don't want to do a short, give them the short end of the stick at Guilford as well. Well, not only Guilford, I mean, you have Calpens at third line, uh, Marylanders with John Eager Howard um, uh, play a pivotal role in that uh, breaking down of the British left flank uh, as they come up through South Carolina. Um, their third line of uh, what's uh, Nathaniel Green, much maligned. Um, he, uh, what is the maxim, you can lose every battle, but win the war. Um, and so the third line at, uh, Mar at Guilford, similar to what Morgan tried to do at Calpens, at defense in depth, but the lines are a little too far scattered, too far uh, beyond each other in support. Um, the, there's actually two Maryland uh, regiments there in the third line, and unfortunately this, they shuffled some of the officers. And so the second Maryland actually will break um, and, and leave the field, where the first will actually uh, entertain in that assault. Um, and that's where it's um, the, the, apart from the Patriot, um, actually, of Cornwallis ordering artillery and firing to his own troops. That's where that myth comes from. Um, actually, there's no preliminary or no primary source, contemporary source that says he actually does that um, at the time. But it is once again a assault that uh, will leave a lot of Marylanders on the field of Guilford Courthouse. Uh, uh, and um, but it is a pivotal uh, engagement. It allows you know, Green to 
disengage. Um, so the Marylanders stalwart defense there, similar to what Washington does at Long Island, um, it provides a pirate victory for um, Cornwallis, who would then have to re, uh, reform and refit. He actually heads to Wilmington and then to his destiny at Yorktown. But I'd also like to actually make a mention of um, one of the uh, undersold stories is actually uh, the retreat to the Dan, which is a river in Southern uh, Virginia. Um, Morgan actually goes home. He's sick. Um, and so one of the gentlemen that takes over uh, is uh, actually Otho Holland Williams. And if you read uh, today, you can find it online or whatever you can read is uh, what accounts of the Southern campaign or his, um, his primary source. And it is amazing because him and uh, late horse Harry Lee will combine to actually kind of provide that rear guard, that constant fighting up through. And because of that service, Otho Williams actually gets a sword from the Continental Congress in uh, recognition of his service. Um, and I'll let uh, Mark finish up, but I just want to tell two quick stories of uh, um, if there's one gentleman, he, although he was born in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, that uh, is synonymous with Marylanders, is Samuel Smith, who serves at the uh, Fort Mifflin, is in charge of the uh, American fort there that guards the Delaware River um, when the British um, take Philadelphia. Um, and if you know anything about Mariners, we are hard-headed, and this is just symbolizing how hard-headed we are. He is actually sitting in the uh, officer's cabin when a cannonball comes through, hits the brick, and knocks him out. Um, but he gains consciousness quickly thereafter, saying that his head was too hard for any kind of British cannonball or so forth. Samuel Smith will then lead uh, the American defense, actually, in the War of 1812 at the Battle of Baltimore. And then I'll end with Baltimore. If you do head down south, since the Orioles just got sold today, I have to make this mention. Camden, named after what the Mariners did at that great battle that uh, Mark wrote about. Uh, but also you travel the street right outside where home runs get hit. Utah Street, named after Utah Springs, where the Mariners then again played. Um, or one of the main thoroughfares, Howard, named after uh, John Eager Howard, who still has a monument that stands in Baltimore as well. So Baltimore symbolizes the Maryland role in the Continental uh, Army by naming the greatest baseball stadium in the United States, Oriole Park at Camden Yards. And so I just want to throw that out because I know I'm speaking to at least one other baseball fan on, on this chat. So um, that'll be my closing remark about how great the Marylanders are. Um, Bill, I think you summed it up beautifully. And, you know, it's the reputation of these young men who's, that still stand strong today. I will say, too, Phil went with the naming. Um, you know, Maryland is known as the old line state. I will admit, before I had lived in Maryland for a time, I believed it was from the Mason-Dixon line that it gets the name. But no, it is not. In fact, it is from uh, the Maryland line during the American Revolution. So he's Mark Wilcox, Phil Greenwald. I'm Kevin Pollock with Emerging Revolutionary War. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Tune back into our Facebook page two weeks from now. We're going to have our historians Mark Malloy and Rob Orison talking about the Tory War in North Carolina. So that's going to be uh, 7 p.m. on our Facebook page on Sunday, uh, February 18th. Uh, so we'll be taking Super Bowl Sunday off because everybody's going to be glued to their TVs watching football, I'm sure. And be sure to find us on the blog online at EmergingRevolutionaryWar.com. Thank you all again for tuning in and enjoy the rest of your evening.